Everybody in Matthew 6? All right. Matthew 6, we're, we're in a sermon series called Best Sermon Ever. And we're going slowly. We're, we're nearing the end of chapter 6. I told you we'd get through it pretty quick. The last couple of weeks, we looked at prayer. We looked at how not to pray. You don't pray for everybody else's benefit. Uh, and from the beginning of chapter 6, we've kind of looked at how... Uh, what we would think of in our minds as spiritual things. Jesus says, this is how you're supposed to do these things. And so he goes through and he says, this is how uh, you're supposed to give to the needy. This is how you're supposed to pray. This is how you're supposed to fast. And if you were here last Sunday night, we had a bonus uh, extended coverage of this series and we covered fasting last Sunday night. But uh, he covers these things that we tend to think are more secular, as we might describe it, more worldly in nature, or, or more religious, I mean, in nature. Now he's jumping over. Now he's going to get into the things that we call secular. I said that backwards a second ago. Before he was getting into the things we consider religious, now he's getting into the things that we might consider secular. And he's saying, it's not just God needs to have his place in your religious life. He's saying God needs to have your place in your secular life. If you are a Christian, God ought to invade every aspect of your life. And that's what he's getting into today. The truth of the matter is, if you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, all of your activities, it shouldn't be spiritual or secular, all of your activities ought to be done for the glory of God. And so he gets into this because we do everything in, in God's presence and in accordance with God's will once we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior, or we should. God calls us to be different from the world in all aspects of our lives. And at the first part of chapter 6, he's talking about how the Pharisees do these things. And he's saying, don't be like those Pharisees. Now he's telling us, this is how the world does things. And he says, you shouldn't be like the world either. You shouldn't be like the most religious people. You shouldn't be like the world. We've talked, uh, especially on Wednesday night, about people that are way over here, people who are way over here, and, and most of the time we want to be right about here. And, and that's what Jesus is getting at here. He's, he's saying you shouldn't be like the most religious people. They're not real anyway. You shouldn't be like the world. You ought to be right here giving everything to me. And so throughout this passage, he's going to show us this is the world's way and this is how foolish it is. And this is God's way and this is how you ought to to live. And so he invites us to compare the world's way to his way and make our own choice. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew 6, beginning at verse 19, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Uh-oh. He's starting to meddle, isn't he? That's what people think when the pastor starts talking about money. Notice I didn't say money for Jesus said money first. He's talking about this thing that hits us all. And it's not just about money. We'll see that in a minute. But that's how he closes that passage. And you say, why does he say that? Jesus talked a lot in his ministry about money because it is a topic that can be filled with danger, not only for the Christian, but also for the unsaved. And so he talks a lot in the parable of the soils. He said that the deceitfulness of riches keep many from receiving Christ 
and being saved. He, in fact, told us that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. First Kings tells us that Solomon, who was the wisest man on earth, let two things turn him into an old fool. And they both start with W. You three boys right here, take notes on this. Two W's, wealth and women. All right, that'll turn you into old fools. Those two things. I'm going to be in trouble after service today. (laughs) Paul warned Timothy. He said, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And he said, some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Solomon himself said in Ecclesiastes 5.10, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. Somebody once asked John D. Rockefeller, who was the Bill Gates of his time, like the first billionaire, the richest man in in the world at the time that he lived. Uh, He owned oil companies. And they said, they asked him, how much money does it take to make somebody happy and his answer was just a little bit more (laughs) just a little bit more most of us spend all that we have just to make our ends meet and and if you think about it you think what would I do if my boss came in tomorrow and he said I'm going to give you a twenty thousand dollar a year raise that $20,000 a year raise is yours. Or if, or if you're on Social Security, what would you do if, if uh, some government official called you up and said, hey, we're going to raise your Social Security $20,000 a year? We wouldn't know what to do with it, would we? We would think, oh, there's all this money I can invest. You know, oh, I bet I could put back more for my retirement Oh, I bet I could do this. Oh, I bet I could, I could get this, uh, uh, you know, I bet I could get, you know, pay my kids braces off. I bet I could do all these things. But in reality, what would happen is we would get that $20,000 and in a year we'd be back in the same exact boat as we're in right now. Because you get that $20,000 and you immediately think, well, I got $20,000. I bet I could afford that nicer car that I've always wanted. And so you go trade your car in and you get a bigger payment. I bet I could buy that nicer house that, that I've been looking at and dreaming about. And so your house payment goes up. I bet I could buy that house on the lake that I've always wanted. And if this is you, you've got to invite Pastor Jeremy to stay there at least once a year. Uh, I bet I could buy that house that, on the little cabin on the lake that I've always wanted. And before long, you've spent that $20,000 a year. And you're right back in the same boat that you were in. Why is that? It's because as our income goes up, So do our wants, because money never satisfies us. It's never enough. Rabbi Hyman Schachtel once said, Happiness is not having what you want, but wanting what you have. Happiness is not having what you want, but wanting what you have. Jesus is warning us. He's saying, don't rely on money. Don't rely on things of the world. And as we look at this passage, we're going to have to see, just like we have from the very beginning, what does Jesus mean in this passage? And what does He not mean? Because some people take this passage and they they twist it around. And remember, you've got to read Jesus' words in context with the whole book. Because we believe this whole book is inspired by God. And so we believe that there's no contradiction. So if you interpret this in a way that contradicts another passage, you're interpreting it wrong. And so we need to look at what he means and what he doesn't mean today. Three things he wants us to see. 
We're going to spend a lot of time on the first one. Number one, he wants us to transfer our treasure. He says, don't store up your treasures here on earth. He says, store them up on heaven. He said, be careful because if you're prioritizing things here on the earth, that's just temporary stuff. All that stuff can be gone in an instant. He says, transfer your treasure from the important things here to the important things there. Before we were saved, there's only one place that we could store up our treasures. Right here. Because we have no reward in heaven before we're saved. Once you're saved, now you've got access to a prime savings account, right? You've got, you've got access to a gold card where you're storing your assets up in heaven. We didn't have that before. And so it was easy to, to put all of our trust in what we have here. But now we have a choice. And we can either store up our treasure here... And he says, you got a lot of issues here because moth or, or, or uh, rust or, or thieves could come in. Or he says, you can store them up there because that's eternal and that's secure. And so he's giving us a choice. You can choose to lay up your treasures in heaven or you can choose to lay up your treasures on earth. We well, says lay up. You know, what, what are we talking about here? It's not... A basketball term, okay? It's not where you go up and just, you know, put the ball in the rim off the, or put the ball in the hoop off the back. But that, that's not what he's taught. Basketball wasn't invented then. What he's saying is you need to invest, you need to store, you need to prepare, and, and he's saying you need to focus on heavenly things, not earthly things. Treasure doesn't just have to be money. When he's talking about treasure, it can be anything that you can hold in your hands. We talked about that last week, about how you know one man's trash is another man's treasure. So something could be a treasure to you that's not a treasure to me. Uh, I, I'll never forget when I was probably t uh, maybe 10, 12 years old, I had brought, took my baseball cards to my great-grandma's house. And she said, oh, you collect those things? <clears throat> I said, yeah. I said, I, I love baseball cards. She said, well, I had a whole bunch of those I burned the other day. She said, Mickey Mantle and, and all these. I'm like, you what? Are you sure you burned them? Are you sure? Can we sift through the ashes, see if any are left? Uh, my uncle would have been right around the time of Mickey Mantle's rookie year whenever he would have been collecting baseball cards. To me, that was a treasure. To her, it was trash. She didn't know the value of it. And so treasure doesn't just have to be your money. Treasure is anything that you put value in. Anything that you look at and you ascribe more worth to it than it's really worth or to more worth to it than, than somebody else puts on it. It's anything that's everything to you. And it's different for every person. It could be your, your reputation. It could be your talent. It could be your finances. It could be your job. It could be your title. It could be your... Your good looks could be your job. It, it could be anything or it could be your money. And so Jesus gives us three examples of what it was in his day, these three earthly treasures. The first one he said is garments. The people's clothes were important to them in those days. And so what they would do is, is as a way of showing off their wealth, they would get their clothes uh, inscribed, stitched with this golden thread. And so you'd be able to look and you're like, boy, that person's pretty wealthy. They, they have uh, you know, gold threads on their clothes. And, and uh, growing up in the 80s as a professional wrestling fan, I think of the million-dollar man Ted DiBiase, who was, who was a, who's a Christian now, by the way. But um, he, he always had you know, inscribed like, a dollar sign right here, and it looked like the dollars were in diamonds and the outline was in gold. And I always, you know, when I'm eight, I think that's real gold and real diamonds. And I'm like, man, he must be really rich. Probably not. But, uh, 
But that's what they did then. They, they put the, stitched this gold into their clothes and they showed them off. And Jesus said, a single moth could take all that away in an instant. Second thing He said was grain. In Luke 12, Jesus tells this story about this farmer who accumulates all of this grain. And, and he, he says, you know, the farmer had so much grain, he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build, build more barns because I've got to have something to do with this grain. I'm going to stockpile it. And Jesus called him a name. And that name was Fool. He said, you're a fool. You're a fool. Why did he say that? Because he laid up the treasure for himself and he said he later died that night. And it all went away immediately. He was rich toward man, but he wasn't rich toward God. That's why Jesus called him a fool. Jesus used the word rust. He said rust would destroy it. When we think of rust, I don't know what you think of, but I'm a Titanic buff. And I think of the Titanic sitting at the bottom of the ocean with the way it looks now. They call those rusticles that are on it. And actually, those are like living organisms. But you've seen metal that rusts. You've seen it, it corrodes. But in this instance, the word rust here literally means eating. It could be gone because you could eat it all. Jesus is talking about the grain could be eaten and it's gone. The grain could decay and it could be gone. Animals could come in. Mice could come in and eat this grain. And, and it all could be gone. Third thing people put their stock in was precious metals and jewels. And he says, when you do that, when you put all your money in this precious metals and jewels, I remember a few years ago, everybody was out buying gold. And that was what everybody was investing in. And you wonder, what do they do with it? You know, safe deposit box? Do they put it under their bed, under their pillow, bury it in their backyard? You know, that's why people come to my house and metal detect around my yard because they think, you know, it's an old house. Somebody probably buried millions there or something. Um, I wish, but I don't think so. All we ever find is trash. Uh, but, um, you know, people could break in. People could steal those things. And that's what he's talking about here. Jesus warns us, if you're laying up your treasures on earth, if everything that's important to you, if everything of value to you is here, it could be gone just like that. He says it could be moths, could be rust, could be thieves. And if moths or rust or thieves could get rid of it, if the passage of time could reduce it, if, if you're storing up these temporary earthly treasures, it could all be gone in an instant. Ask a lot of those people who jumped to their death when the stock market crashed in 1929. It was gone in an instant. Jesus is saying all earthly wealth is temporary. He's saying financial wealth is never secure. Whatever you're putting your trust in here, it's not secure. Just because your money is way safer in a bank vault than it is underneath your pillow does not make it any more secure. We saw what happened to the bank over here in Joplin when the EF5 tornado met it, right? Decimated. It was gone. I don't know what happened to the people's stuff in there. It was insured by the FDIC. It ended up in Nixa or someplace. If it's not a thief that's taking your stuff, it could be another thief. Death could be the thief, right? You lose everything whenever you pass. It could be a stock market crash. It could be a recession. It could be a depression. It could be inflation. It could be war. Or, or it could be death. Something is eventually going to take our earthly possessions from us. And that's what he's getting at here. Mark 8.36, Jesus said this, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus said, If you're laying up only earthly treasures, what you're doing is you're just 
looking for a loss to happen. He says they're temporary. They don't have any value here. Store them up in heaven. Now we talked about what Jesus said. Now let's talk about what he's not saying here. Jesus is not saying that it's wrong to have money. And he's not saying that it's wrong to have possessions. That is not what he's saying here. You've got to look at other scripture to interpret this as well. Because Paul told Timothy, he said, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So those things that we have come from God, is what he's saying. And he goes on, he says, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. What's he saying there? Do you have a nice home? Enjoy it and thank God for it. Do you have nice clothes? Praise God for them because God provided those. There's nothing wrong with having possessions. What he's saying is here's the problem it's when your possessions possess you, it's when your possessions are all you think about. When that is your goal in life, I need more, I need more, I need more. That's what he's saying here. He's not saying that, that you can't have things. He's saying if you're putting your faith in those things, if your sole desire is to get those things, then that's where the issue is. And so he's saying, what, what he's essentially saying is, he's saying, I don't want your real bank account at Arvis Bank to be really high, and you can write any check you want, but your spiritual bank account is in the negative, and if you write a check on that, it's going to bounce every time. That's what he's saying here. You can't take it with you. That's what he's saying. But you can send it ahead. Second thing, Jesus is not saying it is wrong to save for the future. He's not saying it's wrong to prepare for retirement. There are a whole lot of people who are not ready for retirement. And I hope that they don't use this verse as a biblical example of that because that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we're to set aside, that we are to leave something for our families. Uh, Proverbs 6.6 6 says you ought to, to look at an ant and study the ant's ways. And it says, it says, she works hard gathering in the summer so she will have provisions for the winter. That includes money. It's okay to save money up. You may have something come up you need that money for. 1 Timothy 5.8 says this, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Those aren't my words. Those are Paul's words. And they're pretty strong words. He's saying you need to save it up. You need to pass it along. And, and so he's not prohibiting that. So if he's not saying we can't have stuff, if he's not saying we shouldn't save for retirement, what is he saying? The key word is for yourselves. For yourselves. It's this selfish this is my goal is to get more things. That's the mentality Jesus is talking about here. He's forbidding this selfish, self-centered, luxurious living. And he's, he's talking about accumulating all these things so that I can impress everybody around me and I'm not doing anything spiritual in the meantime. He's talking about living extravagantly and luxuriously just because that you can. You can think of celebrities, right? You can think of athletes who live that way. It's, it's you know, they roll up in their Lamborghini or Ferrari. They get out. They, they've got all of these, you know, gold chains around their neck. It's, you know, everything is luxurious about that lifestyle. Then you think of somebody like Sam Walton. 
You know, Sam Walton would show up at Walmart stores and, and they wouldn't even know who he is. He drives in in this old pickup truck, beat up. It's in the Walmart Museum if you want to go down and look at it. And, uh, and he just dry, rolls in. Nobody would have known he's Sam Walton. And, and I'm sure, you know, he'd go in and, and, and take these complaints while he was there. They're probably like, who is this guy? What's well, Sam Walton? Ooh. You know, you expected him to be in a business suit. You expected him to be in a, in a Lamborghini or whatever they had when Sam Walton was alive that was big. Uh, and so that's what he's talking about. He's saying that's what the, the problem is, living this luxurious, extravagant lifestyle. And he gives us some investment advice in verse 20. He says, uh, Matthew 6, 20, he says, you want a surefire payout... He says, invest in heaven. How many times do we go into our financial person and we say, hey, I want a surefire investment. And he's like, well, I can't guarantee you that. This will get you like 8%. You know, this is doing really good right now if you keep your money here. But I can't guarantee. Jesus says, I can guarantee you this. This is a surefire investment strategy. Store up your treasures in heaven. And notice what he wants us to do. He says, lay up for yourselves. So in that instance, we can be selfish. It's for ourselves that we're doing these. It's for later our reward. It's for his glory in the meantime. But we're also laying them up for ourselves, he says. And so he commands us to do what is in our best interests here. You say, how do I... Store up these treasures in heaven. You do spiritual things here on the earth. That's the short answer. You, you follow your spiritual disciplines. You pray. You read your Bible. You, you talk to other people about God. You go out of your way to help people as they come up with different things. You go out of your way to reach the community. You do things that aren't just selfish but you faithfully serve God and you faithfully serve other people. That's what it is. It, it's, it's something that inconveniences you. Matthew 19, 29, Jesus tells us, he said, this is going to be your return. Remember I just told you, your financial guy won't guarantee this. Here's what Jesus says. He says, if we serve and sacrifice for him on the earth, he says, you're going to get a hundred times that in heaven. That's 10,000%. 10,000% interest. Pretty impre Nobody on this earth is going to guarantee you that. But Jesus is guaranteeing us that. Anything... We try to hold on to here will be lost. But anything we store up there is for eternity. The word says Matthew 10, 42. You say, I really still don't get what, what treasures in heaven are. Matthew 10, 42 says this. If you offer even a cup of cold water in my name, then you will receive a reward in heaven. That's powerful. You see somebody out mowing their yard. They they're, look like they're about to die. And you get out of your car and say, hey, here's a water bottle. And you say, you know, God loves you. It's got to be in Jesus, you know, in his name. Here's a water bottle. God loves you. You get in your car, you go. He says, even that gets you a reward in heaven. And so it's those acts, it's, it's the things that you do. It, it's, it's the work that some of the guys are coming out here to do this week to help back here. It's, it's those kinds of things that you don't see. You won't know who helped unless I thank them publicly. They're not doing it for that reason. They're doing it because they're storing up those rewards in heaven. It's all the things that you do for others, those are what we're storing up. And anything we do on the earth has an effect in eternity. It's all related. We have to live life with eternity in view.
Verse 21, Jesus says this, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, you show me your checkbook, or you show me your, your uh, credit card statement, and I'm going to tell you what's important to you. That's what he's saying here. Because I can look at your bank statement or your, your check registry, if anybody writes checks, that may be an outdated example anymore. I can look at that and I can see what's important to you. I can see if you are like my wife and twice a day you go to the coffee shop to get your coffee. Don't say once. You told me last night you've been going twice. <laughs> I can tell you coffee's important to that lady. I know and I'm in big trouble now. You can look at a bank statement. You can see exactly what's important to somebody. Now, when we think of this, it's interesting because Jesus says here, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we think it's the opposite when we, when we hear it in our minds. We think where our heart is, there our treasure will be also. That's not what Jesus said, is it? He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He says, you've got it backwards. So, so you say, well, how do I get my heart in that place? Well, you put your treasure there, right? If you say, how do I get a heart for missions? How do I get a heart for missionary? You start giving the missions every month. And he says that action that you're taking with your treasures, your heart's going to follow. That's what he's saying here. He's saying where your treasure is, where you put your treasure, that's where your heart will go. Think of it this way. Anybody here, I'm going to pick the most crazy stock because I gave somebody a stock tip one time and they never listened to it. And I probably nobody in this room owns this. Anybody here own WWE stock, World Wrestling Entertainment? It's what I thought. I can use this as an example. None of you probably ever look at the ticker when it goes by for WWE stock, right? None of you. I guarantee you, my, my law partner one time was looking to invest in a stock. He had to present to this. I, I, apparently, you know, rich people get together and have these stock meetings. I'm not rich. I don't, I'm not involved in those. But, but he was, and, and uh, he said, I need a stock to present. And I said, oh, oh, WWE. I said, it's nine bucks right now. And I said, they're getting ready to negotiate this new uh, contract when they do that the stock's going to go through the roof he said i can't present wwe that's a wrestling company guess what that stock did it went from nine bucks to a hundred bucks within just a few weeks and i said i bet you feel pretty dumb you didn't put money in it now i didn't have money to put in it or i would have but um nobody here has wwe stock right i bet if you put money in it you'd look at wwe stock and see what it's doing every day my grandpa, when, when he was young, bought some stock from my mom in Tyson. He never cared about Tyson before that. He cared about Tyson ever until he sold it. Every day, but what's my Tyson stock doing? Why? Because he put his money there, so that's where his heart went. When you begin to invest your time, when you begin to invest your talent, when you begin to invest your finances somewhere, your heart's going to follow. And so you say, how do I love God more? You begin investing in His kingdom. You begin having those actions and the words, the, the heart follows those things. That's what He says. Where your treasures are, there your heart is also. Ask yourself this. If you want to know where your heart's at. What do I think about when I have nothing else to think about? That could be your treasure. 49ers football. <laughs> that could be my treasure. Guess what? One injury to Brock Purdy, they missed the Super Bowl and lose. <laughs> 
Second, what do you worry about most? Oh, we're going to talk about that in a few weeks. What do you worry about most? That could be where your treasure is. Third, what do you most fear losing? Some Christians dread leaving this world because they know that they've got nothing stored up in heaven. And that shouldn't be. Store it up there. It, when Paul was getting ready to pass away, he said, I'm wrestling with this. He said, I really want to stay for your benefit, but I really want to be in heaven. And he says this, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. In other words, I've stored up so much in heaven that to die for me is gain. Second thing we need to do. We need to get our vision checked. We need to refocus our perspective. Verse 22, he says, The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. So he uses this illustration of distorted vision now. And, and he says, this is, how, um, this is how your relationship with God and material things can be. And, and I'll give you an example of this. My vision is atrocious. I wear contact lenses. Probably some of you didn't know that. Probably some of you have never seen me in glasses. I wear contact lenses. If I take those out at night, I can't see anything. I can see blur. That's it. And so I don't know how many times I'm laying in bed and I hear a noise and I wake up and I look out into the hallway and there's a person standing right there. It's not a person. It's because my eyes don't see right. It's a shadow or it's, it's something that's so out of perspective. You know, it's a wonder I don't punch Heather in the middle of the night or something if, if she gets too close to me or Ella because I can't see. I don't know what I'm looking at. And what is that? That puts my whole body in harm, doesn't it? If it's an intruder coming in and I think it's Drew because I can't see anything and I say, oh, Drew, come on in, what's the matter? You know, and the guy comes over and shoots me. There's a little danger to my body there, isn't there? Because my vision's bad. My glasses are on the nightstand, so don't try me. <laughs> in Scripture, what he's saying is your eye is an equivalent to your heart. And, and he's saying here, just as your eye affects your whole body, if you can't see, then your whole body is affected. And, and, and praise God, you know, blind people who are blind take great steps today, and they're able to do a lot of things that normal people can't. You ever see a blind person driving a car? I sure hope not. Which leads me to another question. Why do they have Braille on the ATM drive up? <laughs> <laughs> does that make sense to anybody else but think about that it affects your whole body and that's what he's saying here he's saying our ambition what we fix our eyes and what we fix our heart on it affects our whole life it affects everything about us and so it's a question of vision. If you have this physical vision, then you're going to know where you're headed in the future. You're going to know what you need to see. If your vision becomes clouded, you lose your sense of value, and you begin to, your whole life can be in darkness. That's what he's saying there. Third thing he wants us to see. He talked about two different treasures. He talked about two different types of vision. Now he's going to talk about two masters. He says, choose your master. Verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Some of the passages say mammon, and we'll talk about that in a minute. God can only be served with a complete and exclusive devotion to him you can't do it half-heartedly you you can't do it some people want to diversify their portfolios and so well if i put enough in god here and i come to church on sunday morning and i don't do anything else 
through the week. Uh, that, you know, I'm diversifying. I've got my bases covered here, got my bases covered here. God says, you're trying to serve two masters. You can't do it. He says, you're either going to hate the one, you're going to say, oh, church, I don't want to go, but that's what gets me to heaven. It's not, by the way. It's what gets me to heaven, and, and that's, and oh, the world. Man, I love that. Chiefs are playing today. Yeah. That's what he's saying here. Some people want to lay up their treasures here. He said, they got their reward. Remember, we talked about that. It's interesting because maybe some of you have been in this position before. If you have a boss who's like your immediate supervisor, and your boss says, do this, and then here comes your boss's boss, and your boss's boss walks in and says, do that. And you're like, wait a minute, she told me to do this, now you're telling me to do that? And, and it's completely contradictory to each other. And you're like, okay, they can both fire me, which one do I listen to? And it puts you in a quandary, doesn't it? In Jesus' day, slaves could actually be rented out to their neighbors. And think about that. You rent out your slave. Your owner says, I do not want you to do this over there. This was not part of our agreement. And you go over there and the slave owner says, you do this. you got two masters now, don't you? He says, you can't do it. I've been in that position in, in a work setting before. Do this this way. And the other boss says, I don't care what that person says. Do not do it that way. What do you do? And that's what Jesus says. That's the problem. You don't know what to do. Your relationship with God is exclusive. Jesus didn't say you cannot have God and have money. Now what He said, He said you cannot serve God and money. Serving money means you're consumed with it. You think about it all the time. It's the only thing that's on your mind. It's the only thing you care about. If you are scared to death of what's going to happen to your 401k, and that's all you do, sit around and worry about it, maybe you're serving money. If all you can think about is how to get more, how to buy more things, maybe you're serving two masters. Does God direct your life or do you direct it yourself? He says you shouldn't. He doesn't say you shouldn't. He says you must not. You cannot. It's impossible. You have to choose. Some people have the word mammon. You say, what's that mean? Well, it does translate money, but if you have the ESV, it says for money or possession. It's anything we talked about. Anything you put in place. It could be your health, could be your looks, could be your 401k, any of those things. John Connie, come. He asks us three things. Three choices. He gives us treasure here, treasure in heaven. Bad vision, corrected 2020 vision. God, money or mammon. Those are the choices that He gives us. And, and those are the questions that he wants us to ask ourselves today. Where is your treasure? Where's your treasure? Is it here on earth? Is it in heaven? How's your vision? When's the last time you've been to the eye doctor? When I practice law, I ask that in every car accident case. And it's amazing how everybody had just went the two weeks before the accident. How's your vision? You checked it lately? Is it good? 
Or is the focus wrong? And who's your master? Mammon, money, all these other things? Or is it God? 